Hello and welcome to this broadcast of uh, Cruel, Inhuman, and Degrading, a webinar on our recent report on homelessness in the United States under the, national, under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Um, my name is Eric Tars. I'm the Human Rights Program Director here at the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty, and we are excited to have you here today. And for some reason, I cannot get to the next slide. It starts. Um, so as I said, I'm the Director of Human Rights and uh, Children's Rights Programs here at the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty. Uh, we're excited to have with us today Hope Metcalf and Ryan Thorson uh, from the Yale Law School Alad K. Lowenstein Human Rights Clinic who helped us to prepare the report. And we would have had Amy Sawyer and Liz Osborne from the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness with us today, but because of the government shutdown, they are unfortunately unable to join us. However, I will be able to talk a little bit about what they would have presented uh, throughout the presentation. So today we'll talk about the why, the how, and the what of using an international process, what we call shadow reporting, as part of the review of the U.S. by the U.N. Human Rights Committee to change our domestic policy dialogue around homelessness to one that includes accountability to human rights standards. Because of the large number of people on this webinar, we're muting people's microphones, but if people have questions throughout the presentation, you can just type them in the chat box in the GoToWebinar panel on the corner of your screen, and we'll be doing our best to answer them at the end of the presentation. Um, but before we go any further, let's uh, do a quick poll and see how familiar are you with uh, the UN human rights framework and mechanisms? All right, so we've got a varying degree of familiarity, um, uh, about 15% say very familiar, um, and about a, a third than each uh, somewhat familiar or limited familiarity. Um, now, all right. So, why do we at the National Law Center, a domestic policy organization, want to use this international process? Three reasons. First, we want to shine a light on issues that don't get attention here. Second, we want to make the promise of the rights and human rights treaties specific to our campaigns. And third, we want to keep the record straight. What do I mean by this? First, we use it to draw attention to issues and give them specific human rights framing. For example, after the Torture Committee and Human Rights Committee hearings in 2006, our friends in Chicago working on police abuse cases got huge media attention, and every news story referred not just to police abuse, but police torture, as condemned by the UN Committee Against Torture. And after 20 years of working on these cases with no success, they finally got the perpetrators sent to jail and compensation for the victims. This process can have real results. Second, we use it to create standards that we can actually use. In 2012, we were able to get the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness to include language in their report on criminalization, stating that criminalization of homelessness may violate our obligations under the ICCPR, that's the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, as well as the Convention Against Torture. But the treaty language is broad. It provides for freedom from cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment, but if I want to go into a court and say that this standard means you can't criminalize basic human activities, such as sleeping or eating for homeless people who have nowhere else to go, and I want the Human Rights Committee to confirm the U.S. government's interpretation of their obligations, then using this shadow reporting process can help me get specific recommendations 
and language to say that this standard means this outcome, and I can then use that advocacy, that language in my brief to a court or in my policy advocacy. Last but not least, we do it to maintain the record. Ultimately, we believe that housing is a basic human right that all people are entitled to. The right to housing isn't covered by this treaty, but it does cover other rights that people experiencing homelessness often see violated, such as the rights to liberty, assembly, freedom from cruel and human degrading treatment, voting rights, non-discrimination, and others. And when the administration doesn't even refer to these issues in its report on compliance with the treaty, we need to make sure that it is held accountable to its pledges under the treaty. So that's why we do it, to draw attention to our issues, to get specific language to help us in our advocacy, and to keep the record straight. So having dealt with the why, the next question is the how. The process has both formal and informal parts, operating in parallel. And the formal dialogue is between the government and the treaty body, the Human Rights Committee. The first step is that the U.S. issues its report to the treaty body, usually about every four years, but sometimes, often, they take longer. Then the treaty body, the Human Rights Committee, or HRC, will ask questions in writing back to the U.S. government. The U.S. will reply in writing, and then there will be an oral review in Geneva where the committee will ask questions to the U.S. And, uh, and give them recommendations. The final step is the committee will issue concluding observations, which are written uh, statements of concern and recommendations for action. Informally, we as non-governmental organizations can tap into this process. First, by attempting to inform the actual content of the U.S. report as it self-analyzes itself uh, on its commitments under the treaty. Next, we can analyze that report and find where it has shortcomings. We can suggest questions that the committee can ask to the U.S. government. And then we can suggest replies that the U.S. government should give back to the committee. We draft our shadow reports, giving our full analysis under the treaty. We meet with the committee to help them uh, analyze further the U.S. responses. And then we use the observations in practice. I'll go into a little bit more detail on each of these. So first, the U.S. reports. The U.S. report under this treaty came out in December of 2011, which was about two years late after it was uh, officially due. It was over 400 pages long, very detailed, um, and we conducted a brief analysis of the report, pulling out all the provisions that had to do with housing and homelessness. That was over 13 pages long. And you can see some of the sorts of details that they included there. With this analysis, we then shared it with our lists of housing advocates and homelessness advocates and started to collect interest in other people who wanted to use this reporting process uh, for the reasons I described before, keeping the record straight uh, and shining a spotlight on the violations that they see going on and trying to figure out some specific language that they could use in their advocacy. The next official step is for the committee to ask written questions back to the government based on their report. We submitted a short report to the, uh, uh, to the committee in December 2012 that resulted in this question from the committee in, uh, at their session in March that focused in on the criminalization of homelessness. This means that the U.S. had to respond in writing to that specific question on criminalization. We use this opportunity to prompt the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness to host a meeting on criminalization with various agencies, including the Department of Justice, Housing and Urban Development, Veterans Affairs, Health and Human Services, and State, with the intent to inform the U.S. response. The Law Center prepared a draft response of what we would have liked the U.S. to convey to the committee, and we received feedback back from the Interagency Council. Because the U.S. committee submitted its response well in advance of the hearings, uh, by mid-July when we actually had our meeting with all these agencies, the Law Center was not only able to frame the discussion around the U.S. report, but also to gain an understanding of the government's response to that written question and 
use it to focus our efforts uh, in advocacy with them. <clears throat> the U.S. Uh, did put forth a response to the um, to the questions, and although the response did not fully reflect our suggestions, at this meeting, the Interagency Council charged the agencies with responding substantively to our recommendations by their September policy meeting. Amy and Liz from the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness would have said here um, some of the results that came out of that meeting. I can't tell you everything that they would have said, but they did verify that it was, in their words, a huge paradigm shift, a game changer in terms of using this process so that now, rather than just us as non-governmental organizations holding the government accountable from the outside to this process, they are now using it internally, holding other agencies that are part of the Interagency Council accountable to this international process and creating domestic human rights change on the ground. The next step of this process is drafting and submitting a shadow report, or how we view the treaty's application to our issues of uh, homelessness. We actually had begun this process much earlier, as we noted before, coordinating a consulting group of other housing and homelessness organizations back in as early as uh, January of 2012, um, working with non-governmental organizations, directly impacted homeless persons, and luckily for us, garnering the support of Yale's International Human Rights Clinic to help with the drafting. Because the committee has limited capacity, we focused our efforts on getting criminalization of homelessness on the agenda. But our report actually covers many other topics as well. Now I'd like to invite Hope Metcalf, uh, the clinical director, as well as Ryan Thorson, one of the students who worked on it, to give some more of the analysis. Great. Thank you, Eric. Um, so my name is uh, Sorry, we're just uh, fixing the presentation. Sorry, folks. This is Hope. We just had a little issue with um, the program that we're not entirely familiar with. Um, are people seeing what was up on Eric's screen or what's up on more. They're seeing what's on your screen. Um, so if you'd like me to show the slides, I can do that. Yeah, that, that would be helpful. Thank you, Eric. Apologies, everybody. All right, we're back to me. Great. So Eric, if you could just go to our slide. Okay, great. So um, we'll, we'll defer to you to move us along. Okay, and I'll pass it back to Ryan. Thanks, everybody. Hey, thanks. Um, so as Eric mentioned, um, we're both in the Lone Scene Clinic at Yale Law School. Um, and we were, I was working on a report with two other students, um, Megan Cordarino and Alicia Sanchez Ramirez, who uh, together sort of um, helped with the report with, with Eric and Lone Scene. Uh, when we began working on the report, we quickly sort of realized that criminalization really causes a lot of the different human rights abuses that uh, face people who are experiencing homelessness in the U.S. Um, and there were a number of these laws that sort of came up through the course of our research. So things um, at the state and local level on loitering, on camping, panhandling, begging, um, trespassing laws, and then laws about erecting temporary structures, storing belongings, or um, performing particular functions like sitting or sleeping or urinating in public. Um, and all of these laws and ordinances um, can sort of be used at any time. And one of the things that came up in the research was how often they're sort of arbitrarily used against people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, and that can be particularly detrimental when they're used in that way because people um, get sent into detention or in prison for periods of time or will have all their belongings taken. And it sort of has this um, very detrimental effect on people's lives and livelihood. So in the report, um, we sort of centered the argument that punishing basic, unavoidable human functions, um, especially things like sitting, sleeping, and urinating, when people don't have another place to perform them, 
constitutes cruel and human degrading treatment under Article 7 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, or the ICCPR. Um, and then as Eric mentioned, on the list of the issues for um, the U.S. review, the Human Rights Committee had specifically asked about criminalization and how it related to the right to be free from discrimination, which is in Articles 2 and 26. And so we expanded the focus of the report to discuss not only how criminalization which harms all people who are experiencing homelessness, but how homelessness itself has disproportionate effects on um, women, people of color, LGBT people, and other um, minority groups within the U.S. So the main focus of the report was criminalization. Um, and that was both because of how wide of a scope criminalization covers and because um, it's really increasing at the state and local level. And there are more of these laws and ordinances being passed that, that um, which makes it very imperative to respond. Um, the focus on cruel and human integrating treatment was designed to sort of bring together some of the things that are happening in the U.S. and the growing recognition that this is cruel and unusual punishment. Um, and then um, also to look at some of the international standards with the special rapporteurs and other um, officials at the U.N. who are sort of highlighting this as a problem. So one of the um, first sort of sets of um, issues that we were looking at were um, domestic decisions in the U.S. So in 1992, there was a ruling in Pottinger versus City of Miami that found that some of the local ordinances that effectively criminalized homelessness um, constituted cruel and unusual punishment. And then um, a higher circuit court, um, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, found a similar finding in Jones v. City of Los Angeles in 2006. And those were both sort of helpful as domestic decisions that highlight that under the Eighth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, you could also understand the criminalization of homelessness as um, cruel and unusual punishment. Um, the problem with some of these domestic decisions is that they end up being very fact-dependent on sort of certain situations and local policies. And so one of the things we wanted to do with the report was really talk about why this is a problem nationally and highlight the broader repercussions uh, outside of these particular jurisdictions. Um, so there was some, there was a lot of sort of helpful and, and a growing body of um, opinion at the UN level. Um, the user reports from the Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, the Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights to Safe Drinking Water and Sanitation, and the Special Rapporteur on Adequate Housing were all UN officials who have sort of drawn attention to, to this problem and the way that it violates Article 7. Um, as Eric mentioned, we also uh, draw heavily on the US ICH's report, Searching Out Solutions from 2012, where they also um, recognize this argument and sort of say that, that they recognize that um, criminalization can constitute cruel and human integrating punishment under the ICCPR. Beyond that, we also wanted to highlight some of the other rights that criminalization affects as well. So one of the, the main rights was um, the right to the liberty and security of the person and the protection against arbitrary arrest and detention. So one of the problems with these laws and ordinances at the local level is that um, they're sort of arbitrarily applied by police. So police will sort of use them when they feel like they're helpful to disperse homeless population which sort of target people who are living in homelessness. Um, and often this will mean that people will be in and out of detention or in and out of police custody um, which then makes it really difficult for them to find employment or stable housing or sort of um, do all of these other things that are related to sort of arrest and detention records. Um, we also focus on the right to privacy. Um, and one of the reasons for that was that when uh, in some of the, the lawsuits and the complaints that um, various homelessness organizations working with homelessness um, have filed, um, there's recognition that police will often sort of disrupt gatherings of people who are experiencing homelessness or will destroy tent cities or will otherwise sort of invade the privacy of people who by necessity are living outdoors or living in public spaces. Um, and that sort of leads into the final right that we looked at under Article 21, which was the freedom of assembly. Um, the way that state and local officials sabotage tent cities or other encampments um, or the way that they disperse homeless persons regularly violate this right, and we wanted to really emphasize that in the report. Um, and we especially emphasize that it's, it's real, this is really troubling because these communities 
um, often don't have other opportunities to sort of other places to gather or other places to sort of express a political voice. And so it has these sort of um, spillover effects into you know how people make demands and how they articulate their rights to state and local officials. Um, and then beyond the, the criminalization context, we also wanted to include infringements on other rights to make it clear that criminalization isn't the only way that human rights are affected by homelessness in the United States. Um, the first thing that we really wanted to highlight was the right to family um, and the ways that different laws, ordinances, and policies disrupt the right to, to form and maintain a family. Um, one of the ways in which this happens is when available shelters impose rules that force families to divide based on age and gender. So splitting up, uh, saying that children and parents have to split up or male and female members of the family have to split up in order for them to access shelter space. Um, we also focus on the ways that the state intervenes to break up families uh, who are experiencing homelessness, um, and particularly the ways in which definitions of neglect sort of resemble what it means to live in poverty or what it means to not have stable housing. Um, and how that interpretation of neglect, that particular interpretation of neglect, is used to break up families. Another focus, um, particularly after the elections in 2012, were the passage of increasingly restricted voting laws that prevent people who are experiencing homelessness from voting or expressing political voice. Um, so in the lead up to the 2012 election in particular, there was a bunch of new laws proposed or passed that made voting contingent on things like group of identification, group of citizenship, or group of residency. And often, the types of proof that were demanded are things that people experiencing homelessness were unlikely to have. So it would be things like um, proof of a mortgage payment, or an electric bill, or other things that um, sort of implicitly require you to have stable housing. Um, and then finally, we highlighted uh, some of the ways that discrimination not only affects people experiencing homelessness as a group, but affects particular subpopulations within that group in specific ways. So we looked at um, how it affects people of color, women, LGBT people, and um, people with disabilities who often uh, have faced particular challenges in getting access to housing and maintaining housing in the US. Um, as just a final point. Uh, one of the challenges in doing this kind of work in the United States is that the United States um, hasn't signed some of the international agreements that focus on social and economic rights, which include things like the right to housing in, their, in a really explicit way. Um, and the U.S. generally tends to focus more on sort of liberty and freedoms rather than um, socioeconomic rights. And state and local constitutions or state and local um, sort of political systems often place more of an emphasis on those rights. So there's, um, you'll see things like homeless bills of rights that draw very heavily on the right to housing and sort of articulate these rights forcefully. Um, but one of the, I think, really productive parts of, of working on this report was articulating why criminalization is wrong in a civil and political rights framework that is likely to resonate in the US and sort of resonate with people who, who think in a sort of freedom and liberty base framework rather than a socioeconomic rights framework. Um, and for people who are interested in reporting or interested in using some of these international mechanisms, there are other treaties that um, also focus on some of these rights. So the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination um, has spoken out on the criminalization of homelessness in the US as a violation of um, the prohibition on racial discrimination. Um, the Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women has uh, paid special attention to how women and girls experience homelessness, and that's another opportunity to, to highlight the disproportionate effects that criminalization and homelessness have on women. And then um, there's also the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which includes things like the right to housing, um, the right to sanitation, things that um, other countries have sort of used as they've reported on homelessness, but also articulate rights that are often recognized at the state and local level or can be incorporated in the homeless bills of rights and should be used for state and local advocacy in the US, even if it's not um, necessarily the focus of sort of some of the federal advocacy. Um, and with that, I'll hand it back to Eric to sort of talk about how the report can be used and how it's being used and what the process is sort of going forward from Shadow. 
Thank you so much, Ryan and Hope. So uh, now we have the U.S. report, the committee's questions, our shadow report, uh, what comes next. Uh, this is a, another area that's uh, currently under development. Um, right now, uh, the U.S. is scheduled for review in two short weeks, um, on October 17th and 18th, um, in Geneva. However, just as of this morning, we got notice that due to the government shutdown, uh, in addition to taking away two of our panelists for today, uh, they may also be asking the committee for a postponement of their hearings. Um, we will definitely keep people up to date on that. Um, the U.S. Human Rights Network uh, is the umbrella organization coordinating all of the non-governmental uh, interactions with the, uh, with the committee. Um, so if people want updates, um, they can either contact us directly or uh, contact the U.S. Human Rights Network um, at their website, ushrnetwork.org, uh, for the latest on that. However, at this point, uh, since the government has not firmly said that they will not be attending, we are uh, still operating under the assumption that we will be going to Geneva um, next week, and uh, the U.S. will there be uh, reviewed in two three-hour sessions. Uh, the afternoon of Thursday the 17th, and then the morning of the 18th. Uh, these sessions will be live webcast, and you can go to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights website um, and log on to view them. Um, and But throughout the week, uh, we will be briefing the committee in formal briefings, as well as having informal meetings with committee members. Our policy director, Jeremy Rosen, and our human rights fellow, Kirsten Bloom, will be attending and blogging, video blogging, and tweeting from the event. You can follow along at homelessnesslaw.org for our blog, or on Twitter at, at NLCHP homeless, homeless. Uh, and Kirsten's blogs have already started in the lead up to the hearings, each day exerting one part of the report to further share its analysis. Uh, and more will be following in the days to come and uh, once she's actually on the ground in Geneva. So the last stage of the process is for the committee to issue its concluding observations. During the committee's last review of the U.S., we got a concluding observation on the racially disparate impact of homelessness. This observation has been an essential part of our advocacy since then. You can see how it's much more specific than the broad non-discrimination language of the treaty, and that it tells the government it needs to take both adequate and adequately implemented steps. It demands action. This year, we're suggesting the committee make two observations at the conclusion of their review. The first one is a positive rec recommendation, to commend the positive action taken uh, with regard to the criminalization of homelessness uh, in issuing the report from the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness. This recommendation uh, emphasizes the language that we want to emphasize in our domestic policy. It rewards the agency for taking the positive step of talking about human rights in a domestic policy report. And it allows us uh, to recognize the constructive steps forward that the U.S. has actually taken in addition to what we suggest is a more critical recommendation concerning crim criminalization practices. Then we urge the committee to note their concern under a broad range of articles about criminalization, including Article 7, Cruel and Human Integrating Treatment, as well as the other articles that Ryan mentioned earlier. We suggest that the committee call for criminalization practices to be immediately ceased with strong language that's applicable to any context where this would be happening. But because the focus of uh, the treaty reviews is always on the federal government, we specify action, actions that we believe the federal government should take in order to be in compliance with the treaty. Our shadow report goes into significantly more depth on the individual recommendations for the DOJ, HUD, and other agencies which fall under these general recommendations, and through our conversations with the Interagency Council and these agencies, they know exactly what they're going to be held accountable to uh, under these, even these, uh, the slightly more broad language. 
The last and ongoing step will be to use the observations we get this year in our advocacy. If these recommendations from the committee remain just words on paper in Geneva, then we aren't doing our job as advocates. It's up to us to make sure that our government at the federal, state, and local levels are aware of and implementing these recommendations. Beyond just working on issues of homelessness, we are also leading the Human Rights at Home campaign's efforts to create models of institutionalized human rights accountability mechanisms throughout the federal government and down to the state and local level. You can check out hoorahcampaign.org, that's H-U-R-A-H, Human Rights at Home, campaign.org, for more information on that. So, we've been in this process for almost two years now, and we already have some important victories to share. As I said, the Interagency Council uh, has said that it's been a game changer for them in terms of holding their agencies accountable uh, on a structural level to these human rights uh, standards. But what does bringing human rights home look like at a local level? Well, just as we were fin finishing up our shadow report, we were contacted by groups in Columbia, South Carolina, who are fighting a proposed ordinance that would have literally banned homeless persons from downtown Columbia, shipped them off to a shelter outside of the city, and placed a police officer between the shelter and downtown to prevent any of the homeless persons from returning to the city unless they had a documented appointment. Luckily, we discovered through our partners in the Hoorah campaign that they had helped the mayor, who was supporting the plan, draft and introduce a resolution to the U.S. Conference of Mayors last year calling for the local implementation of human rights treaties, including the ICCPR. We included the Columbia example in our shadow report, and our local partners were overjoyed to be able to tell the mayor that not only was this policy violating the spirit of his resolution, but the Columbia itself would be the subject of international scrutiny at the upcoming Human Rights Committee review. Following a meeting with our local partners, the mayor withdrew his support from the plan and has since been tabled. Moreover, as I said, the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, following one of the recommendations in our report, was also publicly opposing the plan and working to introduce more constructive alternatives to the mayor. Uh, Amy and Liz would have mentioned more about this here, um, how they are using the report uh, and the process both in their work at the federal level and all the way down to the local level. But unfortunately, uh, as I said before, they aren't able to join us now. So today we talked about the why, the how, and the what of using this international process to make the human rights of homeless people a real part of our domestic policy conversation. And to bring things full circle, let's see if people's understanding has improved. All right, those are some Good statistics I like to see. Pretty much everybody saying yes that they have seen that improved. And are you likely to use the standards and mechanisms you learned about today in your own work? Again, we've got almost everybody saying either very likely or somewhat likely. So, We've learned about the process of shadow reporting, and now all of you are ready to link your issues to the freight train of justice through the ICCPR process. And uh, I don't know, this metaphor is breaking down, but it was a very good cover that I wanted to, uh, to end with, a nice graphic. 
but despite that, um, I'm happy to take more questions now. You can chat in the chat box at the bottom of your uh, dialog box. Um, again, you can follow along with our adventures in Geneva, whether they happen um, this October, as we hope they still will, or if they get postponed to the next committee session in March, um, at our blog at homelessnesslaw.org, or following us on Twitter or Facebook at NLCHP Homeless, or on Facebook at Homelessness Law. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, feel free to type them into the question box. All right. Um, there's a question about which treaty we're referring to, and can you refer on multiple treaties? Uh, in this presentation, we were talking primarily about the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Um, uh, in our advocacy with the committee, uh, we do rely on jurisprudence from multiple committees, as well as other UN um, human rights monitors, the special rapporteurs that ra uh, Ryan was talking about earlier. And... Um, uh, I'm just seeing now that several people were uh, asking uh, that uh, I talk more clearly into the microphone. I'm sorry if there were audio problems throughout the, the presentation. Um, but yes, so you can, uh, primarily we are talking about the standards under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Um, the other treaties that the U.S. has signed on to include the International Covenant on El the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, for which the U.S. will also be reviewed likely in the next year. Um, they issued their report to that committee in um, earlier this summer, and the committee on the um, committee against torture and other forms of cruel and human and degrading treatment. And uh, that uh, report has come out, but the uh, government has not yet been scheduled either uh, for review by that committee. Um, so those are all uh, applicable. Um, treaties that uh, people can use as part of their advocacy, focusing on the specific rights under those treaties. Um, but again, this one is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Um, there's a question again about um, going into more detail on how to use these strategies on the local level. Uh, the, um, you know, there's no uh, there's no right way and no wrong way to do it. I guess the, the, the wrong way is to do it um, kind of arbitrarily or haphazardly without uh, thinking uh, thinking through the strategy. Um, but there's uh, no official right way to do it. As, as I said, uh, our advocacy in Columbia, South Carolina, just happened to discover that the mayor had passed that resolution uh, uh, or had you know draft helped to draft and introduce the resolution, but that was passed by the entire U.S. Conference of Mayors, um, endorsing the use of international human rights at the local level. Um, we also got a resolution passed this past year by the American Bar Association, endorsing the uh, the human right to housing, and one by the Association of Official Human Rights Agencies. So if your state or community has a uh, state or local human rights commission, um, they're likely a member of that organization. And uh, they all endorsed the human right to housing, uh, opposed criminalization, um, and supported homeless bills of rights as an alternative uh, to criminalization of homelessness. So if, you, um, if your city has a mayor who's part of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, or has um, other uh, human rights committee member or uh, human rights commissioners, uh, you can point to these resolutions of their uh, overarching organizations and say, look, this is what you said uh, you signed on to as part of your uh, umbrella organization. Uh, this is how it should apply here at the local level. 
um, you can use these international processes to help focus attention then on specific issues. So you can, you know, supposing that the U.S. review does happen this next week, um, you can say, you know, the U.S. is being reviewed on criminalization of homelessness um, as well as many other issues in Geneva this week. This is what it looks like in our community. Uh, write a letter to, you know, your, your write an op-ed letter for your paper. Um, uh, hold a community education session at your local library. Uh, do a teach-in uh, in conjunction with some students at your local university or community college. Um, there's, it's all about awareness building at this point. Um, and then really saying that these standards at the international level are ones that the U.S. government itself has signed on to and that we should be implementing um, all the way from the federal level down to the state and local level. You can emphasize the, the federal government's report that, you know, affirms that it's not just us uh, non-governmental organizations saying things uh, about uh, these standards applying, but it also in that uh, in that uh, report searching out solutions that the U.S. Interagency Council put out, they said also these things may vi violate our treaty obligations. So um, there's an increasing chorus of uh, voices uh, talking about how these policies apply at the local level. Also, presumably, once the U.S. government gets back up and running again, uh, the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness has been a very enthusiastic partner throughout this. Um, and so they would, I suspect, be excited to hear from local advocates asking for assistance on helping to educate their local communities um, and their local officials about these standards and their applicability. Um, there's a question about how to uh, apply these uh, to legal cases. Um, they, uh, the best way of using treaty standards in domestic litigation at the moment is um, as persuasive evidence uh, that of what a ambiguous domestic standard should be. So right now we have, for example, the Eighth Amendment that says, you know, uh, the right to be free from cruel and unusual punishment. Um, some courts, as Ryan said, have found that this means that you can't criminalize homeless people for basic life-sustaining activities when they have no uh, safe and legal alternative. Um, some courts haven't uh, agreed with that, so it's still an open area of law. But we're, our hope is that if we have an uh, observation from a treaty that's binding on the U.S. Um, by the authoritative body to interpret that treaty, as well as a wealth of other international uh, human rights monitors who are talking about these international standards um, as cruel and human and degrading treatment. Um, it's language that's very parallel to our own Eighth Amendment standard. And uh, we could go into a court and say, this is how this court should interpret that broad language of cruel and un unusual punishment um, as applied to the situation of criminalization of homelessness. Um, there's uh, many, many law review articles out there uh, on the use of international legal standards um, in domestic court cases. There's a, a number of successful examples, um, and uh, you know, I would direct people to some of those. Also, feel free to get in touch if, uh, if you have additional questions on that front. Um, there's a question, have any, uh, any cities in the U.S. established homelessness as a protected class um, for protection? Um, there's a couple of examples um, of statewide homeless bills of rights which have recently passed in Rhode Island, uh, Illinois, um, and one other state, uh, Connecticut. Uh, that uh, don't recognize homelessness as a protected class um, for some 
purposes, but that do uh, provide that homelessness is a status that you can't discriminate on the basis of. Um, so it, it gives some of that kind of protection. Uh, the District of Columbia at the city slash state level, depending on how you define it, um, does include uh, homelessness amongst their protected categories uh, from discrimination under their anti-discrimination law. Um, and New York City in their uh, recent uh, anti-profiling uh, bill included homelessness as one of the protected categories from profiling by police. So there's uh, all these examples are out there um, and homeless bills of rights are a trend that is picking up um, at the state level across the country. There's no reason that it couldn't happen also at a, a city level. Uh, and um, the ones that have passed so far are these non-discrimination type bills. There are two that are um, that have been introduced. One that's been introduced in California. Um, it's not. They're now waiting to the next legislative session to introduce an updated version because the the version that was introduced didn't get passed. But those versions, um, the Oregon and California bills, um, are uh, are going beyond just that non-discrimination protection to specifically address the issues of criminalization that we were talking about here today, uh, you know, saying that homeless people have a right to, um, to sleep somewhere if there's nowhere else uh, to sleep, to not be criminalized for those kinds of basic human behaviors. So uh, those are, you know, that's definitely a trend, and the, that's a trend that we at the Law Center would like to, to see strengthened. Um, <clears throat> this is also a good opportunity, speaking about California, to mention that um, I'll be uh, on a webinar on Wednesday together with Tanya Tall of Partnering for Change, talking about uh, the right to housing and family homelessness um, out there in California. Go to partneringforchange.org uh, to, uh, to get more information about that. Um, Uh, there's a question about where can the ABA Human Rights Commission and mayor resolutions be found. Um, the ABA and Human Rights Commission resolutions are both on our website, nlchp.org. Uh, they're on your screen. Um, if you look under our news releases or in our uh, newsletter archives, um, you can find in uh, our most recent newsletter links to both of those because they... Um, uh, they both passed just in August. Uh, the mayor resolution, I think, may also be on our website, but um, if you just uh, do a Google search for uh, U.S. Committee of Mayors Resolution International Human Rights, um, you'll likely be able to find it. It was uh, passed at their last session in uh, their last annual meeting in 2012. Um, uh, or if you contact me directly at my email address, I'm happy to, to send it to you. And again, I think these are great tools that we could be using um, on a much more uh, wide basis. Um, there's a question about, is there any way to tell which mayor signed on to the uh, resolution? I'm not sure that there is, but um, that would be uh, a good topic for follow-up uh, research. Um, there's a question about, uh, does a treaty violation constitute a private right of action, um, for example, in camp evictions? Uh, treaty violations do not create a private right of action under current interpretations of U.S. law. Uh, when each of these treaties was passed, they included um, what's called a non-self-executing clause that basically says that you can't bring a cause of action directly under the treaty unless there's been specific domestic implementing legislation uh, designed to implement the treaty, which is not the case for um, most of the pieces of any of these uh, treaties. So the best we can do at this point, um, you know, 
officially under Article 6 of the Constitution. Uh, any treaty ratified by the uh, Senate and uh, signed by the President is supreme law of the land binding on the judges in every state. Um, but uh, that has not been the case with any of the human rights treaties because they have this non-self-executing clause. You could make arguments about why that clause shouldn't be applicable, but it will probably uh, not be successful. So the best, uh, the best strategy, as I said before, is to use it as persuasive evidence of what the domestic standard should be. However, if you check out our report on our website called Criminalizing Crisis, uh, there's a great number of examples of all of the cases um, that do address uh, tent eviction, uh, tent camp evictions, um, as well as uh, other forms of criminalization, sweeps, um, uh, and you know, uh, other forms of, uh, of harassment of homeless people um, that have been successful and discuss uh, all of those cases. So if you're looking for specific causes of action. There's good examples that are there. Uh, the Law Center is also working on developing a brief bank that will be able, um, will be able to share, uh, you know, successful briefing strategies with attorneys uh, who are looking to bring these sorts of cases. Um, so uh, there are definitely other tools out there that you can start with and then work in the human rights language uh, you know, as persuasive evidence, um, both in litigation and, as I said, in policy advocacy, I think there's a lot of room to improve there. Um, there's a question about, is there an article protecting senior citizens or veterans from being evicted from their homes um, that they once owned? Uh, the, there is a protection um, under the ICCPR for the right to property. Um, you know, but again, it's kind of in accordance with domestic laws concerning property. Um, uh, and there is the broader right to non-discrimination, um, which includes a number of protected classes, uh, that, you know, we're familiar with, such as race, uh, gender, ethnicity, religion, nationality, but also includes, uh, social class and also includes, um, other status, uh, which could include things like veteran status or uh, age. And so under both of those sorts of analyses, um, if this is a problem that's having a disparate impact on certain communities, that would be uh, an applicable uh, standard that could be used. Um, under international law in general, forced evictions um, evictions outside of the context of due process are illegal, um, and there can also be arguments about sufficiency of process uh, under international standards, but I think for the most part you would be limited to making due process arguments about the, the process as opposed to, um, you know, whether or not it's allowable uh, in general to, to evict an elderly person or a, uh, a veteran from their home. All right, so uh, we are almost at the end of our hour. Um, I don't see any more questions coming in. Um, if you have one, uh, please ask it. Uh, please type it in now. But otherwise, um, on behalf of my co-presenters at Yale Law School, thank you so much for attending today's webinar. I hope uh, you are able to uh, learn some information that will be helpful to you in your advocacy. If you have any questions, if you'd like help in developing a local advocacy strategy or a federal advocacy strategy, uh, please feel free to get in touch with us. Um, you've got all of our information um, and uh, we will uh, be happy to work with you in doing that. Thank you so much, and uh, if you have any further questions, please be in touch. Have a good day.